Hey, it's Jordan Drake here, hosting for Petapixel for the very first time. And today we're gonna to be comparing the brand new Sony ZV-E1 to the also brand new Panasonic S5 2X. Let's watch a cartoon. Now, fortunately, I've got master videographer Chris Nichols know, behind the I camera. I know, but I want to take photos. Hang on a sec here. Yes. Yes. It's amazing. Yes, Jordan, you give me danger. You're not doing anything. You're a star. Come on, come on. Okay, that's, no. it, it can't change. Anyways, I'll explain to Chris how video works and we'll get started with this. Now, I've had a really nice chance to use both of these cameras. I've actually shot an episode already for Petapixel on the Sony ZV-E1, and I definitely had some experience using it before on our previous Amazon-owned channel. Uh, but also the S5 2X just showed up, and I've been using the S5 II for a long time, shooting a bunch of episodes with it. The X has some new features, which I've been testing recently, but very similar to the S5 II, so I've got a lot of experience with both. Now, these cameras are both very similar prices, and they're both targeting content creators, so I think it makes a lot of sense to compare them. Let's get started with handling. Now, the Sony ZV-E1 is designed to be really approachable for new users. That's why there's not a lot of external controls on the camera body here. There's some touchscreen controls that use really simple phrases like brightness instead of exposure, for example. But this camera can do a lot. If you go into the menus, you'll see there's just a wealth of camera controls in there, but that's kind of a double-edged sword. It means if you're a more advanced user, you're constantly gonna be menu diving to find the functions that you need. And if you're a new user and you push the menu button, you're gonna be absolutely terrified. As well, when you're trying to control exposure, you have to use your thumb for both control dials, something neither Chris or I are big fans of. But the big advantage here, you can see, this is a very compact camera and it's very light as well. I mean, we're talking less than a quarter of a knocked. It's like something in grams, something else in American. I don't know, all that information is gonna be right there. Now, jumping over to the Panasonic S5 2X, I mean, you can see immediately this is a larger body. It is also a heavier one, but we've got a lot of custom controls scattered across the body. And I love that you can just hold one of those down and change the setting. It's very easy, very intuitive. Now, it's not a perfect body. I do find that the rear shutter dial is very easy to accidentally change as well. The top mode dial on it doesn't have a locking switch. So a lot of the time I would pull the camera out of my bag, find my shutter speed way off of the 180 degree shutter I'd normally want to use, and my mode dial would switch to slow and quick or photo mode, for example. Now, both of my issues would be very easy fixes. I'd love the ability in the menus to just lock the shutter speed dial once I set it where I want it. And also I'd love the clickable mode dial that we saw on the GH6. Two minor improvements and this will be a much easier camera to use. So which is the best handling camera? I'm gonna have to give it to the Panasonic S5 2X. It's not a perfect body, but it sure annoyed me a lot less than the ZV-E1. Next up, let's talk about displays. And in the case of the ZV-E1, I should say display. There's no electronic viewfinder on this camera, just a single fully articulating three inch display. Now I do like the fully articulating ones for video, but unfortunately, this isn't super detailed. It's just over a million dots on it. Also, it's quite dim. So I find I pretty much always have to use this in the sunny day mode, which brightens up the screen a little bit. Otherwise, it's just completely useless outdoors. But for the same price, the S5 2X still has a three inch fully articulating display, but this is almost two million dots on it. It's quite a bit more detailed. And that's not even bringing up the fact that you've got a 3.69 million dot electronic viewfinder on this. Now, I know a lot of video shooters don't use electronic viewfinders. The marketing research shows that, but even if your eye never touches the eye cup on this thing, you're still getting a much better viewing experience with just the tilt screen. I'm using the EVF today. Good for you. And it's really no competition here. When it comes to framing up your shot, the S5 2X gives you a much better experience. Next up is battery life and starting with the ZV-E1. It's kind of amazing that they found space in this body to fit the mighty FZ100 battery. And shooting this, I find I'm regularly getting like two, two and a half hours of actual captured footage with it. It's a very strong showing. Now jumping over to the Panasonic S5 2X, it's very fitting with this black on black camera that they're using the BLK22, the black 22 battery, which unfortunately isn't great in this body. I'm finding I'm getting just over an hour of recorded video using a variety of resolutions and frame rates. It's pretty par for the course in this price range, but has nothing on the Sony. Battery, Sony wins, let's go to a new location. Okay, this is a big one. Let's talk about recording options, starting with the ZV-E1. Now to this camera's single SD card slot, you've actually got a lot of flexibility with it. You can record H.264, H.265, 
10-bit video in 420 or 422, there is a lot of flexibility there. The only drawback to this is it does have a micro HDMI port, but that's not going to give you any kind of raw video output on it. Right now, this camera can record 4K video up to 60 frames per second, but with the future firmware upgrade, we're going to see 4K 120p and 1080 240p if you really love slow motion. But the Panasonic actually has some of the most record modes I've ever seen on a mirrorless camera. And shooting 4K, we can record H.264, H.265. You can do ProRes with the S52X as well. The full-size HDMI port on this is going to give you the ability to output raw video. If you're going out to an Atomos, it's ProRes raw, or you can send it out to Blackmagic and get B-RAW on it. Also, you can actually kick out through the USB port to an external SSD and record onto that as well. Now, if you're using the high res modes going up to 6K open gate, you can record up to 30 frames per second. If you're shooting 4K, you can go to 4K 60, though that is with a Super 35 crop. And shooting 1080, you can actually get up to 180 frames per second. So it's faster than what the Sony currently offers, but slower than what the Sony will eventually offer. So the Sony is no slouch, but I'm going to have to give recording options to the Panasonic S52X. I can't think of a shooting situation where you don't have the right record modes or a workflow where you're not going to find something usable. Hi, pup. Next up, let's talk about autofocus, starting with the Sony. And I've been very impressed with Sony's real-time tracking autofocus for video for quite a while. But this gets some of the cool tricks that we first saw in the A7R5 with their AI algorithm in it. And I've just found the autofocus incredibly consistent when I'm tracking people or animals. It's just doing a fantastic job. I also really like that I've got the ability to push a button to initiate tracking with this an interface I've been waiting for for a long time. You don't have to use the touch screen. The only drawback is there's very few custom function buttons on this camera. But if you can work around that, this is a great autofocuser. Next up, the Panasonic, and this camera's precursor, the S5 II, marked a huge milestone for Panasonic. It's the first time that they put phase detect autofocus in one of their camera bodies, and that's a feature that the S5 IIx shares. Now, I have found when you've got a single subject, whether they're human or animal, the autofocus is quite dependable on this camera. It does a really nice job in very smooth transitions as it moves from one subject to another. The drawback is when you've got a lot of subjects in the frame, I find that whether it's humans or animals, the S52X and S52 can get very easily confused. So I would say the autofocus is quite workable on this, but you have to know there's some situations where you're going to be kicking it back to manual focus, just like Panasonic's of yore. When it comes to autofocus, the winner's Sony. I mean, it's just very simple to use, and the accuracy is totally kick-ass. This is the better autofocusing camera. This is a big one. Let's talk about image quality. And both of these cameras excel in different areas. Starting with the ZV-E1, this camera has a 12 megapixel, very fast reading sensor. Now that means that we can record 4K 60 without a crop. In the future, it's going to give us 4K 120p with a crop. And it means we're not going to see a lot of those rolling shutter weird diagonals when you're panning or following a fast moving subject. All of that is great. The drawback is this is a 12 megapixel chip. And it means if you use any of the advanced advanced stabilization mode or the auto framing, all of which crop in on that sensor, you're going to notice a significant reduction in the detail that the camera captures. So very fast scanning, but just not very sharp video out of the ZV-E1. Now the Panasonic S52X has a much more detailed 24 megapixel sensor. That gives it the ability to record 6K open gate 3x2 video. That gives you a lot of reframing options in post, but also the 4K capture on this is very detailed. It's oversampled. And the big drawback to this is it's an old sensor and it reads out quite slowly. So if you want to record 4K 60, you are going to jump to a 1.5 times crop. As well, you're going to have weird rolling shutter diagonals if you're following a fast-moving subject or panning the camera. I mean, you win some, you lose some. So when it comes to image quality, I'm going to call a draw here. It depends on what you're shooting, whether the faster readout and better high frame rate recording of the Sony is going to be more useful than the more detailed video with a few more reframing options that comes out of the S52X. Pick which one's right for you. Hey, it's Chris Nichols here, and I get to talk about photos next. Hey, do I get to interrupt you? You too? just did. All right, so let's start with the Sony ZV-E1. Now, this is not a great picture taker, but in Sony's defense, they've never advertised it as a hybrid camera. It is a video camera that can take photos. The main downsides here, 12 megapixel sensor, of course, no mechanical shutter. So if you are doing fast action and movement, a little bit of rolling shutter might creep in there. However, it is perfectly fine and adequate for social media applications, and the autofocus is top notch. So in that regard, if you want something simple for creators, get images from time to time, but really video is your main emphasis, this will work fine. 
And now here we have the Panasonic S52X. Now this is absolutely being marketed as a hybrid camera and for good reason. 24 megapixel sensor. Now that they've added phase detect autofocus, this is a very capable photo shooter. I do like the fact that if you want more megapixels, you can put this on a tripod and do their multi-shot mode. It also does have motion correction, so that's very handy. Decent burst rates. I mean, all in all, if I'm going out shooting videos and I need photos as well, I'm very confident with this in my hands. Well, I think it's pretty obvious. I mean, the ZV-E1 just gives you a very bare bones photographic experience, whereas the Panasonic S52X is a full featured photographic camera. It's our clear winner. Oh, there's so much to talk about with these cameras, but we're running out of time, so it's time for a speed round. Best stabilization, Panasonic. Best audio, Sony. Best lens selection, Sony. Uh, best assist tools, Panasonic. That's all the information you need. So looking at all of our categories, you'd be thinking, man, Panasonic kind of cleaned up here. You'd be a fool to pick up a Sony ZV-E1, right? Wrong. No, they're just for different types of users. If you're like me, an operator where you're generally behind the camera filming another subject, yes, I do think there's a lot to recommend the Panasonic. I like the sharper video and I love the experience of using the camera far more than the Sony. But if you're a creator who is especially filming yourself, that's where the Sony really comes into its own. It has a more consistent autofocus so you don't have to babysit it. It's got some very intuitive features where if you don't know a lot about videography, this is going to be a very usable camera. And it is very small and compact. So if you're traveling a lot, this might also be a better option in those situations. I am available for hire. I'm very expensive. So if you are looking at the S52X, one of the big questions you might have is, should I get the S52 or the 2X? And really, I think just the ability to output external raw video to a variety of recorders, have external SSD support, internal ProRes, all of those are worth the $200 premium over the S52. If you're a video shooter, this is the one to get and you get that sexy black on black typeface. And if you're looking to get access to the really nice 12 megapixel sensor in the ZV-1, should you grab this or the more expensive S3, FX3? I think if you're a single creator, save the money. This is a very capable camera, but if you're a professional operator, get one of the higher end cameras. It's just gonna be worth it for the convenience. Dear God, Jordan, this video's long. End it now. Okay, um, this camera's good. This camera's good. If you wanna watch us talk about other good cameras, you should subscribe to the channel, but you're also gonna wanna follow our socials and find out what we're up to. And also we're now right on petapixel.com. Swing by the website and see what we're up to there as well. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you all again soon with another episode on Petapixel.